Hey, what's going on YouTube? What's happening guys? You guys have tuned into Rules for Rebels and in today's video, we're gonna be talking about Netflix's all new documentary, White Hot, The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie and Fitch. I thought there were a lot of good lessons and takeaways uh, in regards to marketing, uh, as well as like how to create a brand image. So that's what we're gonna be talking about in today's video, as well as the documentary as a whole. Um, you know, one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize or don't remember is that Abercrombie uh, is not just some brand that popped up out of nowhere in the mid to late 90s. Abercrombie had actually been around since 1892, and it used to be kind of an outdoor store for, you know, hunters and fishermen. I, I think Teddy Roosevelt used to shop at Abercrombie, uh, Ernest Hemingway. And, uh, you know, my grandpa always tells this story. Whenever my grandpa used to see people wearing Abercrombie back in the day, uh, my grandpa has this Belgian Browning shotgun. And, uh, you know, it was his pride and joy. My grandpa was really into uh, bird hunting, like pheasants and things like that. Um, and my grandpa would always talk about how he bought this Belgian Browning shotgun and it, you know, it cost him four, you know, four weeks or eight weeks of pay. And he wound up taking it over to Abercrombie & Fitch on Michigan Avenue in Chicago and he got, uh, oh, I forget the name, uh, uh, some kind of choke put on it. So you can kind of control the, uh, the, the spread of the shot when it comes out of your gun. Uh, but, you know, I always thought it was interesting that, you know, Abercrombie, we think of as being this fashion brand, uh, and it used to be an outdoor store, and, you know, it was probably back in the 50s or whatever. My, uh, my grandpa went and got his shotgun work done at Abercrombie & Fitch. Um, obviously, Abercrombie & Fitch, Fitch was acquired by the L Brands, uh, the L brands are, you know, Victoria's Secret, Bed Bath & Beyond, a lot of kind of the, the top stores. Uh, man, what's the guy's name? Wexler, uh, the, the kind of genius behind the L brands, uh, who also was, and the documentary kind of gets into this. He was a buddy of Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, he actually wound up pretty much uh, signing over all of his wealth, all of his businesses to Epstein. Not sure what Epstein had on him. I'm sure he had some kind of blackmail material or something like that. Uh, but that part's kind of crazy. He actually let uh, Jeffrey Epstein uh, claim that he was a Victoria's Secret model scout. And that's kind of how uh, Jeffrey Epstein got access to a lot of the women. Uh, but they called him like the Merlin of the mall. He, uh, he was very good at buying like dying or dead brands and kind of turning them around. And that's what he did with Abercrombie and Fitch. Now, in the beginning of the documentary, uh, they kind of talk about how they created the brand and kind of revamped Abercrombie and Fitch. And in a lot of ways, Abercrombie and Fitch was way ahead of their time. You know, there's, uh, I go to a lot of marketing conferences and things like that. And right now there's a term called, you know, it's probably not brand new, but there's a term called experiential retail. Uh, you know, obviously retail stores, brick and mortar is kind of dying. A lot more people are doing their shopping online. Uh, you know, mall culture is pretty much dead. Nobody really goes to the mall anymore. And you really need to give people a reason to, you know, bother to go to a brick and mortar store. So we have something called experiential retail. I think, uh, you know, just to give some examples, I think Ikea does a very good job of experiential retail. You know, most furniture stores, if you walk in, it's kind of just a big warehouse store with couches all over the place. But if you walk into uh, an Ikea store, they have rooms put together and each room kind of has a different vibe or a different kind of feel. And it's kind of an experience going into an Ikea store. I mean, even to the extent that they have, you know, the food court, you can go get some Swedish meatballs or breakfast with, uh, you know, Swedish pancakes and lingonberries. At the end, they have the little shopping area where you can get yourself a hot dog, a slice of pizza, uh, you know, some soft serve ice cream. You can buy some snacks. Going into an Ikea store is an entire experience. And in a lot of ways, Abercrombie was one of the earliest businesses to get into experiential retail. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I think we all remember from Abercrombie stores in the mall, but that I never really put that much thought into, you know how Abercrombie had those dark wood shutters uh, along the windows of their store? You know, most stores are putting their, their merchandise in the windows. They, they, you know, there's a term obviously called window shopping, right? Like you see something in the window and you want to go into the store. Abercrombie actually did the complete opposite. They put shutters in so that you couldn't see what was going on in the store. You know, the smell kind of wafted out of the store. You might have saw, you know, a hot shirtless person in the doorway of the store. But to actually see what was going on inside, you actually had to enter the store. And then when you entered the store, they were very particular about the mannequins that they chose, how the jeans sat on the mannequins. Um, you know, all of the employees were attractive. Uh, they went around spraying everything with cologne. It was, it was an entire sensory experience. 
So Abercrombie was one of the first businesses to get into this whole idea of experiential retail, which is kind of interesting. Um, and I'm not going to dive too deep into this, but if you guys just think about <coughs> Abercrombie stores and what the experience was going into an Abercrombie store, you know, it, it wasn't just a room with clothes on racks. There, there was an entire experience involved you know, with going into an Abercrombie store. So they were one of the earlier businesses to get into, you know, quote unquote, experiential retail. Uh, they were also kind of doing influencer marketing before the internet was really around, or at least before the internet was what it is today. Uh, they talked about how uh, Abercrombie used to have scouts and they would hit up college campuses and go to fraternities and they would get the coolest or most attractive fraternity guys and they would get them to come work at the Abercrombie stores. Um, and, you know, it kind of got me thinking, it was kind of a, a, you know, a throwback or a flashback in time. Uh, you know, today we have Instagram and Pinterest and TikTok and everything is online. But I mean, back in the day, there was no Instagram. There was no thoughts on Instagram. There were no cool people on Instagram. Um, you know, if you, we go way back to that period, I mean, you had men's magazines like Maxim and FHM. And that was uh, in some ways what kind of shaped culture and what brands were cool and what lifestyles were cool. Um, and just think about how different that is in a, a relatively short period of time that used to be, you know, young men's magazines like FHM or Maxim and, and today it's, you know, Instagram. Um, but way back in the day, Abercrombie would, would send these scouts out and uh, essentially these were influencers, right? They would get lacrosse players, they would get uh, frat bros. And uh, that was kind of their form of influencer marketing before the internet was even around. <coughs> Now, I, I really didn't even know if Netflix, or if Netflix, I didn't even know if, Am, if uh, Amazon, man, I, I can't get my, uh, get my mind straight today. I didn't even know if Abercrombie and Fitch was still around today. I couldn't tell you the last time I, I've been into a mall, so I had to ask my girlfriend. I said, is Abercrombie still around today? And she said, yeah, yeah, they're still around. They've kind of changed their image. If you go on their website now, you know, it's two guys kissing and it's much more diverse. Um, you know, they've definitely kind of changed their, uh, their brand image. And uh, the documentary kind of touches on that whole thing and why that happened. And to me, it kind of seems like a little bit of pandering. And that's kind of what the, uh, the documentary said as well. Uh, Abercrombie was a brand that built itself on exclusivity, right? Like, uh, you know, a store like Old Navy, you know, I would say today as a whole, stores and brands want to include everybody. Um, and, you know, I think one brand that we can look to is like Dove. Remember how maybe 10 years ago Dove started featuring a lot of like plus size models? Um, whereas previously it would be very fit, skinny, attractive people. Um, you know, I, I don't think necessarily that brands today care about people or care about uh, inclusivity. I, I think brands today want to make money. And if you look at it, uh, you know, I don't know the stat off the top of my head, but well over 60% of the American population is considered obese. You know, we are a country uh, of fat people. And so if you're going to cater your brand to only skinny, attractive people, you're really cutting the, uh, you know, the, the, the market size or your customer base. Uh, but there is something to be said for exclusivity. People want to be the cool kid. People want to be the cool guy. People want to associate with some image or some lifestyle. And this is true in all areas and all walks of life. How many of you guys have been to a club, like one of these, you know, cool clubs in a, in a big major city where, you know, the, the bouncer kind of handpicks who comes in? Oh, you know, a guy can't come in unless he's got two girls with him. You have to be dressed this well to come in. You have to be this attractive to come in. Uh, so these types of bars and clubs are very exclusive, but people line up hoping to be one of the chosen ones to get in. I mean, you know, I think fashion as a whole is something that uh, is either exclusive um, and you have to buy it to be a part of it, or fashion is uh, an industry and a thing that tries to make you feel like you're not worthy uh, unless you buy their product. You're, you're not cool unless you spend a bunch of money on our t-shirt. You're not cool unless you spend a bunch of money on our cologne. So, uh, you know, this documentary was kind of a hit piece on Abercrombie and Fitch. And I think they even kind of touched on it at the end. They said, you know, look, they said Abercrombie and Fitch isn't the only brand that uh, maybe makes people feel bad about themselves, that doesn't cater to overweight people, um, that caters to a certain type of people. Abercrombie didn't invent the idea of exclusion, uh, but Abercrombie really sold themselves on exclusion and uh, they were unapologetic for it. And they got a lot of hate for this. And, you know, I, I don't think Ad Abercrombie was a, a great company. I don't like a lot of the things that they were doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, I do have to say I do have some respect for, you know, I do have some level of respect for somebody who is willing to kind of, I don't know if you want to say stand behind their message or acknowledge what they're about 
and not kind of hide behind it. Take a brand like Calvin and Klein or any number of other brands who, you know, they make very slim fit clothes for skinny people. Uh, their price point is high enough that not everybody can afford it. There's a certain image they want to portray. They're not going to outright come out and say that we don't want fat people wearing our clothes or we don't want XYZ person wearing our clothes. Uh, but it's pretty much implied, whereas Abercrombie is a company where they actually came outright and said it. And one thing that, uh, that I noticed is as the documentary went on, it got worse and worse and worse. At first, it was like Abercrombie isn't a very inclusive and welcoming brand. Oh, Abercrombie is racist. Oh, Abercrombie is homophobic. Oh, oh, and the CEO and the photographer behind all the iconic Abercrombie images uh, were you know, doing the whole Me Too thing and trying to fuck all the male models. Um, and so it kind of continued to get worse and worse and worse uh, throughout the documentary. Uh, the CEO was, was like a lunatic. I mean, he, at the beginning of it, it started out and you look at him and he, he was an older man, but I mean, he was a, a fairly handsome older man, had a very, uh, you know, kind of had that like rich kind of preppy look to him, wound up getting a ton of really bad plastic surgery and uh, by the end of the documentary, I mean, he looked like a, a, an evil villain from uh, uh, like uh, an Austin Powers movie. I mean, his, he had so many like eye lifts or eye surgeries that his eyes looked all crazy and like were pointing to the sky. His cheeks looked crazy. I mean, he just looked like a complete lunatic. Uh, so that was kind of another interesting thing about this documentary. I did pull up, uh, I'm kind of too embar embarrassed to admit, I'm, I'm kind of uh, going to pull up a Cosmopolitan article here. Um, you know, rather than me just rambling, I like to have some kind of foundation for these stories. And, uh, you know, it was a long documentary. I didn't really take any notes. So I wanted to make sure there weren't any points that I, uh, I kind of neglected to hit. So I, I found a Cosmo article that's titled The Seven Most Surprising Takeaways from Netflix's White Hot, The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie and Fitch. And it says, what's, what, what about po poodles is uncool? And so before we get into this, I, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, kind of lessons or takeaways we can get about branding. So one thing I see a lot of new entrepreneurs do, you know, a lot of people want to start their own brand. They want to have their own fashion brand or their own fitness brand. Um, if you want to see some examples of this, go on Reddit and go over to the subreddit r backslash review my Shopify. And you'll see a lot of people who they throw a fucking panda on a shirt or they throw a tiger on a shirt and name their brand, you know, the alpha male brand or whatever it is. And uh, there's really no thought behind it. You don't really know what the brand is about. You can tell they don't really know what their brand is about. Uh, but they think that just throwing a, you know, a, a, a logo or an animal on a shirt automatically creates a brand. And one thing that was uh, really interesting about watching this documentary, you see all the thought that went behind what Abercrombie & Fitch was and what Abercrombie & Fitch wasn't. And they had a very strong brand image. And they, they kind of went through when they were kind of creating the brand. They had this slide deck. And the slide deck was basically what Abercrombie is and what Abercrombie isn't. So what Abercrombie is? Abercrombie is a, a Jeep Wrangler. Uh, Abercrombie isn't a, uh, you know, Volkswagen Jetta. Uh, you know, guys who wear Abercrombie don't wear gold chains. Girls who wear Abercrombies either don't wear jewelry or they may wear a delicate silver ne necklace. Uh, Abercrombie is guys who play lacrosse or row crew. Abercrombie isn't guys who do, you know, this. Um, <coughs> even, even down to the dogs, right? Like in an Abercrombie catalog, Abercrombie is all American, it's elite, it's cool, and uh, a dog that you would see in an Abercrombie catalog would be a golden retriever, kind of an iconic American dog. Uh, Abercrombie would not be a poodle, which is why they kind of refer to poodles here. So there was a lot of thought that went into the brand image and, and what the image behind Abercrombie was. And that's kind of true of all fashion, right? Fashion isn't about buying merchandise. It's, it's about buying into a lifestyle or buying an image. And even if you look at like functional clothing brands or functional brands, most of these brands have kind of left behind what made them a good brand uh, in favor of, you know, some type of image or appealing to everybody. Um, you know, look at Dickies. Dickies is a brand who is known for making work gear. Then they kind of became more of kind of a hip hop urban clothing brand. Um, and the quality of their materials wound up going downhill. Look at a company like North Face. North Face used to make really hardy, hardcore gear for outdoor sportsmen, climbers, and the quality of North Face stuff has really gone downhill, and now it's just a fashion brand. Same thing happened with Patagonia. Um, and even look at a company like Carhartt. You know, I know we recently had the, the whole hubbub about Carhartt and uh, vaccinations and everything. 
but Carhartt has become a hipster brand, right? Like even though it, it makes work gear for guys who work in the trades and work outside, over the years the quality has gone downhill and now they sell $40 Carhartt hats to hipsters. So, uh, you know, even functional brands whose advertising, in my opinion, should be about how hardy their gear is, how it holds up, how it's tough, uh, they've kind of gone in favor of let's try to bring as many people into our, our brand fold and our brand image uh, as possible. And the, the quality of our goods isn't so important. You know, we don't make gear for, you know, tradesmen and construction workers anymore. Uh, we make, ge- uh, we, you know, we make gear, or make clothing for the, you know, the overall, uh, you know, public. Um, but uh, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. I've been rambling a little bit. Let's, uh, let's hop into this article just to see if there's anything that I missed here. The seven most surprising takeaways from Netflix's White Hot, The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie & Fitch. What about poodles is uncool. So uh, the article starts out, Netflix's new documentary, White Hot, The Rise and Fall of Abercrombie & Fitch, may be hilarious when it's describing a shopping mall as a search engine you can walk through. You know, kind of interesting. Um, and it's kind of what they went through, like around the time that Abercrombie came on the scene is when we started getting a lot of like really uh, niche specific stores. So, you know, if you were a punk rocker, you would go to Hot Topic. If, uh, you know, I, I can't think of any, any of the stores were kind of like the hip hop urban culture. A lot of them were, were smaller ones and not necessarily big chains. Um, you know, if you want, if you were kind of more of the surfer or skater style, you'd go to Pacific Sunwear. Um, you know, each store kind of has a, a certain vibe or a certain image to it. And even though, Net, even though Netflix, even though Abercrombie and Fitch was kind of attract, uh, attacked for not being inclusive, you know, I feel like all of these stores are kind of exclusive. You know, if I go to, if I were to walk into a Hot Topic, I kind of expect to see a girl wearing fishnets on her arms and legs, uh, maybe a short skirt, a band t-shirt, and a dog collar on her neck, right? Like if I walk into Hot Topic, I expect to see a guy wearing like skinny tee, uh, skinny jeans, some Chuck Taylors, uh, like a Goodwill t-shirt, um, and maybe a spiked necklace and some of those gauges in his ears, right? Like there's a certain thing that you expect to see when you walk into a certain store. When I walk into Pacific Sunwear, I expect to see kind of a surfer style. So the fact that Netflix, or that Netflix, I keep saying Netflix, the fact that Abercrombie and Fitch is kind of attacked for wanting to portray their certain image, you know, I don't know. I, I think that's, I can't really get behind that. Uh, but back to the article, uh, but the 90s are once again on trial as the Netflix documentary digs deep into the brand that defined the quote unquote cool kid for a decade. Ready to cringe about how toxic Abercrombie and Fitch culture was back in the day, even if you kind of kind of knew it deep down, fair warning, you're going to need an adult beverage uh, to make it through this trip down memory lane. And I'm sure they're probably going to talk about this in this article. Uh, but one of the big things in this article, I didn't even really remember this until I saw the documentary, but uh, Abercrombie and Fitch had some, I don't even want to call them racist because, you know, I, I didn't necessarily think it was racist, but they had like, uh, they used to do these graphic tees and they talked about what a great business it was because it was like uh, 80% markups on them. And there was one that said like two Wongs don't make a, or two Wongs can make it white dry cleaning. And it was, uh, you know, kind of uh, playing on stereotypes of Asian Americans. And uh, they had another shirt, something about one, like one, one, one more for the road. And it was like a donkey with a sombrero and a taco, which was kind of, you know, quote unquote, attacking Mexicans. And uh, I guess I didn't really remember this, but I guess there was like a bunch of protests and things like that in, in Times Square and across the country. Um, and Asian Americans were protesting a lot of these shirts. And uh, it's really interesting to see how much times have changed. They, they showed a clip from a Saturday Night Live skit where Tina Fey was kind of joking about this and said, you know, Asian Americans across the country are protesting Abercrombie and and Fitch for their portrayal of Asians on t-shirts. And she said, the protests were peaceful. (coughs) The protests were peaceful, nonviolent, and organized. However, you know, when it came to people exiting the parking lot at the end, that wasn't the case. And I think it showed a bunch of cars crashing, obviously like making fun of the, the stereotype that Asians are bad drivers. And it's, you know, it's just kind of interesting that like that's something that you could never get away with today. And I think comedy gets a lot more leeway than, you know, other areas of life. Uh, but it's interesting that, you know, Tina Fey was never, uh, you know, canceled or anything else over this. Um, yet, uh, you know, yet Abercrombie was. Uh, back into the article, some things are not all that surprising. You probably put together back in LFO times that Abercrombie and Fitch's stores were purposely dark, loud, and oppressively fragrant. Fragrant. 
It doesn't take much convincing to see that their hiring process was racist and the exclusive and all-American look they perpetuated was overwhelmingly white, cisgendered, and thin. Even... It's even a shock to learn that the staff was told what to wear down to their underwear when you consider that said underwear was probably partially on display. This was a time when bra straps and low waist were the goal. But the documentary still manages to reveal some things. Here's what I learned. At least six former male models sued Weber between 2017 and 2018, as reported by the New York Times and the Netflix documentary. Weber has denied all accusations of wrongdoing and ultimately settled the lawsuits against him from the six male male models. The lawsuits did not accuse Abercrombie of wrongdoing. These kinds of accusations are discussed in the documentary. So Weber is, uh, I guess, a famous photographer who was the guy behind the images and all the Abercrombie bags and in the Abercrombie stores. Uh, There was a magic formula to Abercrombie's success. Heritage, elitism, and sexism equal exclusivity. In White Hot, former employees describe the way they perceive the brand. According to the documentary, the specifics that define what is and what is not the brand are pretty wild, too. Anyone who rolled into high school in the 2000s knew the popular kids drove Jeeps, uh, but I'm, but I'm going to be thinking about what was not Abercrombie and about poodles for the rest of the day. Some staffers said they were instructed to act like you annoyed them. Thank God I wasn't just a loser. The stores were engaging in professional nagging. Lacrosse was considered an unconventional sport. This isn't a big reveal. It's just funny when one of the persons interviewed says Abercrombie and Fitch catered to white guys that played unconventional sports like lacrosse, which seems true when you think about it, but also maybe that's on me. I grew up putting Abercrombie guys on a pedestal, even though I wasn't in their country club world, lacrosse seemed normal enough to me. Uh, To me, lacrosse is kind of a, like, lacrosse has gotten a lot more popular in the last 10 or 15 years, especially in certain areas of the country. Uh, But I mean, conventional sports are baseball, football, and basketball, right? Uh, so many celebrities used to be a and models. The documentary cites Olivia Wilde, Penn Badgley, Kellen Lutz, Taylor Swift, Jennifer Lawrence, Chana- Channing Tatum, Ashton Kutcher, Heidi Klum, and January Jones for starters. <coughs> Here's where they talk about Tina Fey. Tina Fey made a racist joke about groups protesting a and racism. Abercrombie and Fitch pulled the line of t-shirts featuring Asian stereotypes because of a protest staged by Asian Americans. The protest was nonviolent and orderly, but the same cannot be said about the parking lot when they all went to drive home. Uh, and that's from Saturday Night Live, The Weekend Update, April 20th of 2002. Part of becoming woke, genuinely woke, not whatever Fox News is calling woke these days, is realizing that as a privileged person, racism may have gone right over your head in the past. That's just something many of us have to recognize and deal with in our lives. So while I remember the backlash surrounding Abercrombie and Fitch's racist tease, I don't remember Tina Fey making this racist joke on SNL. It is sadly a good example of how prevalent microaggressions and casual racism were in the 2000s. I hate the term microaggressions. Uh, Apparently, Abercrombie rebranded. I have not stepped inside an Abercrombie store since at least 2010. If not earlier, I grew up. I moved on with my life. I released any hope or desire to be one of the cool kids targeted by brands like Abercrombie and Fitch. So it's news to me that they may have since rebranded with a commitment to diversity and inclusion. In response to Netflix's documentary, this is what the brand said in a statement. In the spirit of transparency, we want to directly acknowledge the news of an upcoming documentary that will feature Abercrombie and Fitch and focus on an era that took place under previous leadership. While the problematic elements of that era have already been subject to wild and valid criticism over the years, we want to be clear that they are actions, behaviors, and decisions that would not be permitted or tolerated at the company now. As we've evolved, we've felt the love from this community. We are grateful for the support you have given us as we've taken intentional steps to be inclusive and welcoming to everybody. Thank you for giving us a chance to show you who Abercrombie is today and for being part of who we will be tomorrow. We know the work is never done and remain committed to continually creating the company of which we can all be proud. Um, Let's see, that's an Instagram post. I was going to see if there's any comments here. Uh, we don't have any comments. Uh, anyhow, I, I thought it was, you know, I kind of enjoy these Netflix documentaries. I know not everybody out there is a documentary person. And even though I've kind of soured on Netflix as a company and I might wind up canceling it soon, uh, I will say Netflix does a great job of making documentaries that appeal to people who don't traditionally like documentaries. I love documentaries, even the drier ones. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like documentaries. Uh, but one of the things Netflix does a great job of is my girlfriend is somebody who normally would never watch a documentary. Uh, but some of these Netflix ones, whether it's uh, Bad Vegan or this uh, or any of the 
other number of Netflix documentaries out there. They do do a great job of making docu documentaries more entertaining, probably a little bit dumbed down as well, but that appealed to the masses. I thought this was kind of an interesting one. If, uh, if you grew up in an era where Abercrombie was kind of the cool brand, uh, this is kind of nostalgic in terms of like some of the music that they played and things like that. Uh, I was never really very into Abercrombie myself. I think I owned like one Abercrombie t-shirt. Um, and maybe one button up that I got as a gift or something like that. Abercrombie was never my thing, but uh, it definitely kind of brought you back to mall culture and things like that. One other thing I wanted to point out, I think there's kind of, uh, I think cultural changes in a lot of ways are what kind of killed Abercrombie. Uh, the end of mall culture, uh, the body acceptance movement. Um, you know, I had a bunch of points earlier. I got to wrap this up. I'm actually kind of running late to, uh, to a meeting right now. Uh, but I think a lot of the cultural shifts and cultural changes we've seen over the last 20 years uh, have, have played a large part in Abercrombie no longer being cool and, you know, the, the whole thing of exclusivity no longer being acceptable, even though all fashion is, is in some way about exclusivity. But uh, that's all I got. If you guys saw the documentary, I would love to hear your guys' take on it. Go ahead and drop a comment in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. If you're not subscribed to the channel, click that subscribe button down below and ring the bell. And uh, we'll catch you guys in the next video. Later.